All right. Um, welcome everyone to uh, my session for the Bobby and Dikarutang Memorial Lecture Series. So in this particular session, we'll be looking at the fundamentals of debate, the WGM edition. So obviously, this will be uh, a bit more geared towards um, including reminders for the WGM, the NCMs, uh, but it's not only applicable to these communities. Obviously, anything here might be applicable to anyone. I just have a few special reminders for the non cis community, the WGM community, as well as if you are a POC in a tournament where you, know, you have to deal with native speakers who aren't POCs, some of these reminders are pertinent to you as well. So essentially, what this session will entail will be uh, me, including certain reminders of the do's and don'ts that we should all have in debates. But also, this is meant to serve as a very brief survival guide uh, Survival guide when we're out in debate land. Uh, this is something that won't be too extensive. I think if you have followed the other sessions, uh, they might be uh, with that same aim as well, because we understand that there are a lot of math sessions out there in the internet, uh, on the internet. So obviously this is meant to be just something to tie in what you've already learned. Uh, if you know of some of these things that I will be talking about, they will be uh, just reinforcements of what you already know. If there are certain new techniques that you will learn in this session, uh, just add them to your repertoire, add them to your toolbox. If they work for you, great. If they don't work for you, feel free to modify. Not, nothing here, just as a disclaimer, is meant to be the binding rule of any form of uh, debater, right? Because obviously norms change and we have to adapt to norms within debate land. But obviously what I have here is based on the most concrete or the most um, common styles that we should always adopt because these are techniques that only improve. They don't necessarily change or become updated. So this is applicable to every, anyone and everyone, like I mentioned. Uh, but some reminders are a bit more pertinent to WGMs. Uh, if you're a WGM POC, this is more pertinent to you. Uh, if you are a POC in a, in a tournament that doesn't have many POCs as well, this could be very applicable and important to you for certain uh, parts of this session. So what will we be looking at? There'll be four parts to this session. The first is we'll talk about how you should manage your way through discussions. The second, we'll look at some debaters checklists that you should essentially have. Uh, so things like what should your prep uh, have? What should your uh, fact sheet or fact file have? All of these things uh, might be relevant from a debater's perspective. The third part will be us talking a bit about how you can get just other things from debate and not just speaking at tournaments. If you are someone who wants to aim to be a career judge, that's completely fine for you. If you are someone who wants to aim to be one day at scoring at major tournaments or just generally any tournaments that's completely something uh, that that's fine for you as well. Lastly, we'll talk a bit about, we'll have a chat on expectations and reality. How do we manage our expectations? How do we deal with criticism and the noise that essentially will happen in debate if you are a minority uh, member of the community? All of these things are quite inevitable. You just have to learn to navigate your way through them. All right, so part one, managing your way through uh, discussions. All right, so for this particular part of this session, we'll look at how do you deal with uh, your teammates? How do you navigate through panel discussions if you are a chair or a panelist or a trainee? And then we'll look a bit at how do you manage your way through discussions in at core settings as well? Some of these things will not be shown on the screen. Uh, what I do end up discussing might not all be displayed on the screen. So make sure that if you are taking notes, if you have any questions, you can stop me and ask me. Uh, otherwise, you can always just rewind the recording later when it's available on the internet. All right, so let's talk a bit about how to deal with your teammates. Before I go into any of these uh, different types of interactions that you might want to um, agree on a common line with, with your teammates, um, make sure that you as a WGM in your team, if you are a WGM in your team, make sure that you are not doing all of the brunt work of the managerial aspect, the administrative aspect, the organizing aspect. This is common. Uh, it's not just something that is an argument in debate, uh, debate rounds or debate motions. It is an actual culture. 
that unfortunately WGMs are often expected to be the responsible one, often expect to be expected to be the managerial uh, administrator of the team. So you have to wake everyone up, you have to set everyone's alarms, you have to be the mother. You are not there to babysit anyone, right? So at tournaments, you also have your own priorities and your teammates should have their, their own priorities and responsibilities as well. So before we go into any form of uh, different interactions that I do want to cover, make sure that you create that sense of understanding with your teammates. Um, sometimes you will have juniors, right? And that's okay. Sometimes you might have to do a bit more of the handholding in that aspect. That is to say, you might have to tell them how things work, you might have to tell them if it's an in-person tournament, where do you go for the briefings? What do you need to do? What are the different documents that you need to have? If you are traveling for your in-person tournaments, um, obviously UADC is online, but for example, the Madrid of UDC will hopefully be uh, offline and in-person. And in these kinds of settings where it, where it is offline, maybe there are certain things you do want to check up on each other about, right? So things like, have you gotten your visa sorted? Have you made sure that you've uh, printed your tickets, things like that. Things like that are fine. But in terms of going above and beyond to make sure that your teammates become functional members of a team, there has to be a limit. So just, obviously this is different according to different teams, maybe you have a system, but make sure that you are willing to set those boundaries because especially if you are a WGM, this should not be on you. Uh, it is extremely stressful, speaking from experience as well, when members go missing and you have to be stressed about them going missing, you have to worry about them. But at the same time, roll call is happening. At the same time, motion release is about to happen. So you have four or five different things to think about. All they have to think about is waking up when you tell them to wake up. That's not okay. Right, so make sure that you create that sense of understanding with your teammates. Uh, obviously, this doesn't have to lead to a big blowout. You don't have to argue, but you have to be willing to say, this is not okay, fix yourself up, right? So all of these things are things that are expected out of each teammate and each team member. So you are fully entitled to make that concern heard if you have that concern. Uh, speaking also as a WGM, this is something that often we don't, tell our teammates about because we're scared about it being something bigger. We're scared about being uh, you know, unprofessional or seeming like we're making issues out of nothing. This is an issue. It's unprofessional and it's not okay. So tell your teammates that. Um, again, extremely exceptional circumstances where someone oversleeps, that is fine. But if it's, a current, if it's a recurring thing and it's a proper habit, make sure that you tell your teammates, this is not okay, you need to fix it, okay? so. Uh, even if you're not a WGM, if you are expected to do all of the brunt work, tell your teammates that. Also, if you want to have certain systems where you do make certain uh, things your job, make sure they have their jobs as well. So if your job is waking everyone up, someone else has to be getting the breakfast, someone else has to be getting the coffee, things like that. Make sure that everyone has a task that you are not uh, parenting anyone through the process unless you know they're actually your child or your junior that needs a lot of help okay so with teammates how do you navigate your discussions uh, with uh, them before and during tournaments so it is important and i feel uh, that probably in the previous sessions this may have been indicated as well uh, it's important for you to have a system of prepping understanding each other even before a tournament happens all right so as much as possible get into the groove of prepping during lunch. I know it sounds a bit boring and it sounds a bit tedious, but if you can, if that's your thing uh, and that's your only time that you can meet your partner or your teammate, make sure you do that, especially for UADC where it's a team of three. There will be three different heads uh, that will bring ideas, but there might at times be three different egos. So there has to be a system that is sort of set into rhythm before the tournament happens. You must understand each other's styles. You must understand how do I speak to this teammate? How do I speak to that teammate? How do we make sure we reach compromise? How do we make sure we limit the time that we spend arguing on directions in a debate? Um, how do we work our way through that? All of these different small nitty gritty details and issues, they have to be sort of like sort of settled uh, to a certain extent before the tournament. All right. So even if you don't, during the tournament, it's natural to have 
some of those quibbles, some of those quarrels, that's completely fine, but you want to minimize the number of times that happens. Okay, so before tournaments, get into a rhythm. Prep with your teammates already. Schedule times to meet for discussions. Important, please bond if you can. Um, tournaments are going to take a lot of your time, sometimes your money, your energy, your emotional capacity, your, your mental space. It will Tournaments will take a lot of that. Right, So this sport will take a lot of that as well. You don't want to spend all of that time hating your teammates. Uh, sometimes you work with people that you might not be completely close with and you want to be professional. That's completely fine and that's ideal. That's expected. You have to be reasonable there. But you also want to give your teammates a chance. You want to give this opportunity a chance and you want to give yourself a chance as well. Um, essentially to enjoy the time that you will have to end up spending with each other. So if you can, play video games, right? A lot of teams bond over FIFA. A lot of teams bond over things like Among Us. Like those small things will help you bond and it will make communication easier. Those things will help make communication easier because you're no longer talking from a perspective of someone uh, who does not want to speak as if uh, you are a friend to other people, right? So that is important, just as a reminder Get into rhythm, bond if you can. Uh, for WGMs, it's not and it's not at all necessary to only bond through video games if you're not into them. There are other things like books, movies, whatever you can. Even if it's just as simple as you know bonding over lunch, that's completely fine. All of these things just try to get into a rhythm. This is also a perfect environment to sort of have post mortem discussions. Let's say you have a training the night before or the day before and the next day you guys meet for lunch before you prep anything just say there are a few things that i'm not happy with there are a few things that i want to talk about there are a few things that i think we can improve on do not be afraid to say i i don't feel i was heard or i don't feel i was being listened to yesterday things like that air those concerns out air those grievances out there should be some space and some time for that warning uh, before it happens at the tournament because you don't want to go through a tournament that way either, right? But be brave. Don't be scared to do those things. Uh, and in fact, you're entitled to do those things and say, it's not okay that this idea was dismissed. I think this idea was important. This reason is this, 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 right? So all of those things, just be a bit more uh, willing. Don't be afraid to do those things. Uh, before the tournament as well, as I mentioned just now, divide the work so that you're not doing everything on your own, especially the more quote unquote responsible or studious task uh, uh, or things that are seen as more managerial and organizing, right? So fact sheets, making them, printing them. If you are someone who has to have them in your hands, that's fine. Just say, I want to print them so that I have them physically in my hands because I want to give myself that sense of personal satisfaction or that security. I need to have them with me. That's completely fine. But don't let it be an issue of you having to do it because no one else ever will. If that happens, make sure you scold them, scold your teammates a bit, don't worry, right? You have to communicate. Obviously, this is something that's important to everyone, especially when it's a major uh, tournament. A lot of emotions are at stake, a lot of importance is placed upon it. So you want to try as much as possible um, to not carry any weight of resentment from having done a lot of work to the tournaments. You wanna make sure that during the tournament, you focus on each round at a time, that's the important thing uh, without having to worry about all of these other things that make you extra angry at your teammates, all right? So all of those things are things that you should uh, be unafraid to do as well. And your teammates should know uh, because they shouldn't be enabled or allowed to do certain things that are problematic as well. During the tournament, okay? Set lines, which should not be crossed. This is in reference to communication during the rounds themselves um, or during the tournament as well so for example like i mentioned earlier if someone is constantly late if someone is always rude uh in uh, messaging etc etc you can voice those concerns out if your teammate is not listening to it perhaps find an ally or try to discuss with the other teammate to have this discussion set right um this is obviously important in situations where this can be an issue uh, most teams make it out without having these types of issues so if you do not have this issue with your teammates, that's great. That means you guys are on a good, uh, on a on a good pathway, right? So this is only in situations where it can happen. 
you can still be professional and keep communication healthy while also making it clear some things like them constantly going missing, constantly going for smoke breaks uh, during prep time. Not okay. Okay, speaking from experience. So try your best to also just manage those expectations, um, but at the same time, make it clear that certain things just need to be changed on their end. Uh, at the end of the day, if certain things continue to happen and they're out of your control, don't be too stressed. It's not your job to parent or focus on anyone else. If you can, also place a bit of trust on, on, in your teammates, right? If you really, really, really can't do anything about this, nothing changes in this system, they're still going for toilet breaks for like 10 minutes during prep when you want to discuss. Worst case scenario, have some trust in your teammates. That's extremely important. Maybe in those 10 minutes, they find five or six arguments. They find the framing that they want. They are able to settle themselves and settle their nerves. Maybe that's their coping mechanism, all right? So all of these things come um, with understanding what they are like, like I said, and that goes into what we mentioned or what we talked about before as well in terms of understanding how each person's style likely is to be. So all of these things that you can't control at the end of the day, breathe, all right? As WGMs, we think, if we can't do it, we have to, we have to make sure um, something is fixed and we fixate on that sometimes because we're expected to be either the admin or the uh, person making sure things at the end of the day settles itself. Sometimes it's okay to breathe and just trust in your teammate, but at the same time, focus on yourself. Prioritize yourself, okay? So in those 10 minutes, if your teammates are missing, don't worry, focus on what you have, what are the things that you definitely want to talk about, or what are the things that you think you should be focused on, focusing on in this particular debate? Should it be something to do with uh, comparatives that you want to make clear? Maybe it's the feedback from a previous round that you want to fix, so you immediately go into that direction and think about that. All of these things are extremely important, all right? So like I said, if you can, communicate with your teammates, uh, get into a rhythm, get into some sense of understanding with your teammates, if they continue doing certain things that are out of your control, like waking up late, going missing, at the end of the day, don't absorb that stress and let that stress affect you. You also have to focus on yourself and prioritize your mental space and use that mental space that you have for yourself during the tournament, okay? So during prep, when prepping, let your voice be heard. Don't be afraid to challenge ideas. Don't be afraid to push for some ideas within reason, of course. You don't want to just push for the sake of having something to say. You wanna make sure that this is something that the entire team will benefit from discussing, things like that, okay? Um, don't be afraid to also tell your teammates that you need to say something or be the devil's advocate and continuously poke holes at your own case so that you find responses to them. But also don't be afraid to um, stop someone from cutting you out. So what does that mean? If you are speaking, very often people will either speak over you, whether or not you are a WGM, this can happen to you, but it is culturally also unfortunately true that WGMs are more likely to be susceptible to this. When you are speaking, someone cuts out, someone cuts you out, right? So someone cuts you off, speaks over you, uh, tries to continue your sentence, try to explain over you when you were just about to explain those things, all of these things, it's important to make sure you have the chance to also say, but also be unafraid to say, I'm not done, I'm not finished, uh, give me a second, I was still speaking, things like that. It is okay. I've done that even with my best friends uh, while we were prepping or while we were teammates. It is okay. It will sort itself out. You have to essentially have, like I said, the boundaries earlier to know that what you are speaking to right now, who you are speaking to right now is a debater, not your best friend. Afterwards, you guys can go back to being best friends if you want, all right? During rounds, decide on a system. Just that like you have to have a system before when it comes to prepping, when it comes to uh, the, the tasks before, the motion release, etc. have a system during the round itself. If you are a speaker that prefers notes, then tell your teammate. If you have anything to say, write them down. Keywords over full sentences or full sentences over keywords. If you feel like your teammate needs to write down a bit clearer, just say, yo, I can't understand this. Can you write clearly? Things like that. It's okay, but decide on that system. If your teammate prefers verbal communication, 
uh, during their get their own speech or for example an opponent is speaking and they are going their speech is going to be next your teammate is going to be next if they prefer you speaking to them in brief and concise uh, manners um, in a brief and concise manner between parts of speeches then oblige as well right so be willing to also compromise there and speak to them if they prefer verbal communication and vice versa but if you are someone who prefers notes or if you are someone who prefers verbal uh, communication during speeches just for tips that your partners or your teammates might be giving you make that clear as well okay now we'll look at how do we navigate through discussions with fellow judges and at core members. So this will refer to some panel discussions as well as uh, when you are in meetings or motions dis motion discussions with your at core members. If you are a panel in VP, focus on key comparisons straight away. Try not to be too lengthy, right? Oftentimes, uh, chairs might ask you, for example, what did you think about this case? What did you think about the interaction between CG and CO, for example? Um, straight away go to the clincher if you can and briefly and concisely also touch on the things that were spoken about but you don't think were as relevant to the metric that wins either side of the debate right so try not to be too lengthy because chairs or other judges have also seen the debate that you have so they would not appreciate you talking too much on the same uh, issue uh, know the difference as well, of course. If they are cutting you off before you even speak about what exactly is important or the clincher, etc., cetera, uh, have the, the, the bravery also to voice that out, either in that panel discussion if you're a WGM or later on as well. Make a complaint to the ACHCOR, make a complaint to whatever relevant authority that you were not being respected in your panel discussions. That's completely fine. But try not to be too lengthy in the sense where you're regurgitating or you're just repeating the debate. Right? Don't sacrifice the explanation of a specific interaction in the debate, but also don't have, you don't have to go overboard with regards to uh, every single thing that was said by a team. When you are chairing in BP, start with the, these are just things that you can do. This is probably a non-exhaustive list because there are certain rounds where it might be different. Start with the one uh, comparison that unanimously overlaps. So if everyone thinks opening government was first, start from there pivot from there, from what was the most discussed and see how all these other teams interacted with those uh, same metrics that one opening government would be. Or discuss the lowest ranking team, who was fourth, why were they fourth, and then move your way up from there. In a messier debate, start with opening half interaction, closing half interaction, or go through benches, which of the bench, uh, which of the uh, teams in the bench outweigh the other, things like that, right? So go into a direction is basically TLDR here, um, have a system, but also if you are chair, especially if you are WGM, make sure that you are not afraid of chairing your panelists. This is particularly important uh, for WGMs that feel like, oh, they're chairing a bunch of people who are experienced, they're chairing a bunch of people who are also big names. No one cares, you are the chair, you manage that discussion, don't be afraid of anyone on that panel, they have to listen to you, all right? So don't be afraid. Now, chairing anything, whether it be in British parliamentary, whether it be in uh, discussions after the debate in 3v3, uh, probably not UADC because UADC doesn't have judge conferral, but any other format that might have you discussing with judges at any point in time, pay close attention to discussion direction, direct the content in a pointed fashion, be mindful of repetitions. If someone is repeating something they've already said, if someone else is repeating something someone else has already said, you can say, excuse me, I think that can be moved on from. So we can move on from that. We can talk about something else perhaps, things like that, okay? And be mindful of biases. So if you are a non-WGM, be mindful of your biases. Are you paying more close attention? Are you letting the person who is, uh, male presenting, are you letting someone who is uh, more aggressive dominate the discussion? Like that's partly uh, sometimes the case with more experienced judges. They might be a bit more dominant in discussions, but you have to understand where you're coming from as well. If you are a chair, you need to let each member of the panel have their say, or at least have their opportunity to say something. Dealing with teams. Now, 
OAs need to be persuasive speeches too, right? So in the same way that debaters have to have a certain level of method or persuasiveness when they are delivering speeches, when you are delivering your OAs, don't be too critical of certain members as if they are unimportant, especially when those members are WGM communities. This, this does not mean that you do not give them any form of criticism, but save that for feedback later or save that for constructive feedback in a way that is framed properly, not offensively. But when you are in OAs, make sure that you recognize every single member's contribution. Uh, this I've seen straight uh, either from first or secondhand experience. Make sure that if there is a WGM um, speaker in the first speaker position and you are not a WGM person in uh, judge as the judge of that room or in chair position, make sure that you check your biases as well. Do you have an anti-first speaker bias? This used to be an issue uh, where first speakers would get discredited a lot, no matter how much they did, uh, whether or not they were WGM or not, but WGMs were more affected by this perception. Uh, do you have certain personal biases about people who are a bit more uh, mellow? Do you think anyone who has a higher pitch is less convincing, always check those biases, right? So make sure that you do not use those in your OA or let that affect your OAs in any way. But when you are going through your OA, now this applies to anyone. When you are delivering your oral education or your RFP, try as best as possible to go through the main issues in the debate respectfully. But at the same time, give the teams uh, the same level of respect that you expect them to give you. So when it comes to talking about this issue, uh, you don't have to say things like, oh, this was like a stupid issue, or this, this was an issue that I felt was really silly. Don't use those terms. Don't talk about those terms um, or, or those arguments in that manner. Talk about them in an objective way, right? So this argument was not fully uh, relevant, given the fact that number one, number two, number three were the ways that we had to prioritize in this debate, things like that, objectively. And at the same time, this is important uh, for WGMs, because WGMs often uh, get discredited sometimes, no matter how well they do their, o their OAs. If you are doing this and you are clear as possible, you are focusing on metrics and weighings, you are doing your best to essentially deliver the oral adjudication in a way that is quite possibly very like hardworking, that, that, that shows you're, you're hard, working hard at it, but also that shows that you're being very methodical at it and you don't necessarily get a high score at the end. Understand that sometimes that's just not your problem. It's not a you problem. Sometimes that will happen. What you have to do is not let that affect you and as much as possible, not use those small numbers or rankings to also define your level or your experience in the sport, right? Just make sure that when you are dealing with teams, you stick to your own metrics of how to be persuasive to be clear, how were things weighed and why they had to be, um, sorry, there was, there's a type for them, but why they had to be weighed the way they were instead of regurgitating the debate as well. There is a tendency for a lot of judges to, like I said just now, uh, just vomit out the debate back in hopes of this convincing the teams, it won't. Right, so that won't do it. So you have to just focus on things, uh, be clear, be concise, be the boss at that discussion. Do not be afraid of teams. Uh, like I said earlier, if you are chairing, you cannot be afraid of your panelists. If you are a judge, you cannot be afraid of your teams. Uh, at the end of the day, even if they say things about you, ignore them, right? Who cares? Uh, motion discussions. Now this is important. Focus on the three basic C's and whatever they mean to you, you can interpret it however you want. But um, the three important C's that I think are relevant here would be confidence, your confidence to push for your motion ideas, confidence to suggest a tweak on another person's idea, suggest a tweak on someone else's motion, confidence to say that other motion does not sound good. Here are the reasons, like do it, right? Have the audacity. A lot of people will be half as talented as you or half as qualified as you, but have twice the audacity. You have to have the audacity to say, I don't think this motion is particularly good. Do whatever you need to to prove and convince, uh, but at the same time, also reach a compromise. If for example, like I said just now, if it's a 
tweaking on that motion, if it's a motion that you can at the end of the day defend, even if you're not completely happy with, compromise on that. Uh, don't be too uh, stubborn as well. But if you are completely uncomfortable with it, you can say, I really don't like this motion and you should expect or you should be entitled to some compromise from the rest of your core members as well. Creativity, be bold, right? Have uh, discussions on things that have not been discussed. Have discussions on things that have been discussed, but perhaps from a new angle. Have discussions on things uh, and motions on things that may have been overly discussed, but you think are really good anyway, and you can just tweak and create new uh, perspectives on those particular same motions completely fine. Just be creative with your process. Don't be afraid. And lastly, comprehension. Understand who this debate is about. Understand what this debate is meant to be about. Understand the aims of the motions that you are setting. Uh, don't be afraid um, to push for those ideas. But a lot of the times, I think the best agile discussions work well when everyone feels that they can contribute, which is another C, right? So everyone feels that they can contribute. So if you are a non-WGM, don't discredit someone or don't completely isolate or block someone out. Always check your biases, whether or not uh, they can be real biases or maybe they're subconscious biases or maybe they're just unintended or accidental biases. Make sure that you check them. Um, also make sure that everyone could maybe uh, have their ideas salvaged if you think there is a tweak, right? If you are a WGM, a lot of the times I've seen uh, members of the Arch Core come in and basically say, actually, we can still save that idea. We need to fix this, 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 this. Completely fine, right? Navigate your way through those discussions. You are working as a team, but don't be afraid to be um, respected and revered in that spot, right? You are Arch Core for a reason, whether it be you are a CA or a DCA, whether, you're, whether it be that you are a new member of the Arch Core, uh, take up that chance and just be as... Uh, as essentially as lethal as possible with your chance as you can be, right? Part two. Okay, so the debaters checklist. So what I'll be going through here are some checklists that all debaters should ideally uh, have in the back of their minds. They don't have to be fixed checklists, uh, particularly for WGMs going through tournaments. These are checklists that might help you as well. Things that could add to your toolbox, as I said. Okay, so this will be your personal kit and survival guide uh, to help with tournaments, your prep, your content, your responses, some personal tips and tricks and reminders as well. Um, let's start with knowing your formats. Always know your formats. I know it sounds simple. Um, obviously here, I've just listed some formats, but always know what they entail. If a format says uh, you have 15 minutes of prep, obviously you have to work your way through that system, make sure that your teammates understand that. If a prep says, uh, if a tournament says you have 30 minutes of prep, obviously you have more time, create a system, but that format says you have pure eyes, which is like UADC, right? You have pure eyes. Make sure you utilize them. Don't let go of the opportunity to be offensive in strategy against your opponents in AP formats because pure eyes are super important, but pure eyes are super crucial. You can frame a lot in your pure eyes, so make use of them. Right, uh, Australs obviously will not have your eyes. That will change the way that you navigate your speeches. Again, knowing your formats matters. Okay. Next on this checklist, have personal aims. This is important because some people they want to win a lot. That's completely fine. Some people they just want to come back from a tournament, um, perhaps reaching a higher speaker level than they previously were at a different tournament. That's completely fine. Some people go in because they just want to understand topics a bit better. They want to uh, be able to speak a lot better. Whatever these personal aims are, it is good for you to have a list that you can refer to, aims that you can essentially hopefully manifest, you know, um, whether or not you're superstitious, whether or not you are a believer. I don't know. Sometimes it works for other people, you know, like you say in existence and maybe it can happen. A lot of the people have said they want to win this cinema, that cinema, this cinema, and sometimes... Um, having that ability to dream allows for you to also have the confidence to work your way to it, right? So sometimes have it written down, have it as a personal list, it helps, especially if you are a minority uh, in the debate scene, whether or not you're a POC, whether or not you're a WGM, whether or not you're a WGM POC, okay? Uh, these things can psychologically affect you. Just have those things personally available to you. Logistics, like I said earlier, uh, being prepared. Okay, so have 
things in a list that need to be uh, generally assured before the development. Before prepping, have all the issues sorted, have your timer and your stopwatch out before the motion is released. If you want to time 30 minutes, if you want to time 15 minutes, whatever you need to do. If you need to write the motion down, be ready with your pen and paper before the motion gets released. If any definition is unclear, once you see the motion, ask the ACHCO immediately. Okay, this is very important. A lot of people are scared. They don't ask. They wait for other teams to ask, and that will affect your time, especially if you are at online tournaments where sometimes a lot of people might not be privy to some clarifications because their connection is bad or whatever. Immediately ask. Don't wait for other teams to do it. Even if you think this is an obvious question, um, I don't want to seem silly, do it, right? Block out whatever voice that is and just do it, okay? Having a team strategy, this is on your checklist, as I mentioned earlier, but it's not just about having the different tasks that each person needs to do. It's also about picking a strategy when it comes to um, how you want to prep. Do you want to immediately have discussions after the motion is released? Are the three of you that type of uh, speaker that you can essentially immediately discuss? Or do you need to have some minutes to yourself just to have clarity and mental clarity on the motion? Basically, a portion your time as well. If you have 15 or 30 minutes for UADC, you will have 30 minutes. Make sure that 10 minutes uh, at most is what you're going to spend on a particular idea. Move on after that. Maybe last 10 minutes, focus on responses, focus on preemptions, things like that. Maybe in the last five minutes, let your first speaker write and organize their speech. Move on to speaking to the other remaining member on different things that you guys can deal with or you uh, all as a team can deal with during the debate. Okay, have guiding questions as well. If you like to be silent for first few minutes of prep, don't be idle. What that means is don't, don't phase it out, don't zone out, right? Think about guiding questions and have the team start from there. So these could be things like, let's think about who might be the most important in this debate, important person in this debate. If there is a clear attack you think might come from the other team and you don't know how to answer that, ask your teammates to think about ways you all can deal with it, right? You won't have to immediately have these answers, but highlighting specific questions to focus on while you're walking to your venue or while you are waiting for uh, the three minutes or five minutes that you have given yourselves to be up, these questions can already highlight or direct you to what are the areas you need to already be answering when the prep starts. Uh, quick check. Quickly double check with your teammates to make sure everyone is on the same page. Uh, a lot of people, when they go silent for five minutes, after five minutes, only then do they realize or discover that maybe three of the members have very different views of what the debate is. Uh, at the start, if you think there is a risk of this motion being interpreted differently by three people in a team, and this is not because the motion is bad or in any way. Sometimes the motion is perfectly reasonable, perfectly clear, but three people have very different experiences and lived experiences. So three people might have different ideas of how to interpret that motion. If you can come to a common ground from the start, if you can incorporate all three from the start, that makes your prep not only more organized, but it helps consolidate all of the contributions from your team if they're all workable, right? Confirm which side you're on. Small, but very important, okay? Uh, emotion release, if you can, by motion release, before motion release happens, you already need to know which side you're on, but just in case, uh, in the worry or in the stress of a tournament, sometimes these things happen, you forget which side you're on. The topic that you will be debating and whether everyone understands that you are meant to support or oppose a particular thing. The topic that you will be debating, I know it sounds like a very small logistic issue. It's very important. There are three motions. Uh, some people might misunderstand which one was vetoed. Um, do this with your opponents, but also do this with your teammate. Okay, so we're doing second motion. Okay, on this motion with Gov, we're going to be um, supporting this particular action. We're going to propose this particular policy. At physical offline tournaments, you can do this while you're walking to the debate venue. At online tournaments, just take a few seconds after motion selection to do this with your teammates. Ask questions, okay? So these are basic questions that we have all heard before, but keep this in your arsenal, keep this in your bag of tricks so that you have something to talk about um, or at least look at and look for in the motion already. Uh, so some tools you need to have ready in your arsenal as well. So prep checklist, what can it look like? It doesn't have to be this sequence, but you should all, all, already always think about these things and incorporate these things. Context, habit, 
not just for your entire debate, but with each argument, with each stakeholder, with each level that might need a different context. Contextualize as you go, right? Characterize, how do people behave? What exactly are their interests, their motivations, et cetera, et cetera. Model, if it's a policy motion, you need a proper policy. Otherwise, you need to at least frame the debate, explain that this debate is about X, Y, Z. What are we okay with? What are we not okay with? What do we have to defend? What do we not have to defend? These things are not just important in prep, they're important in the debate themselves, debates themselves. So you have to tell your judges that, right? So all of these things, just being a bit more methodical in prep will help you in the round. Uh, almost 60% of, uh, at least from my personal perspective or my personal opinion, more than half of the debate uh, is going to be affected by what happens in prep. So if you discuss clearly, if you have a good prep that even if it's messy, if you discover the different parts that are relevant, you cover the parts that are important, that are likely to be hurting you in the round, that are likely to be contributing to your win in the round, these things are going to help you a lot in the debate itself. Arguments, obviously, your impacts, okay? So these are consequences, but at the same time, impacts on principles, impacts on just general norms, they don't, impacts here do not refer to only consequences or practical outcomes. Always uh, pay close attention to principle. Uh, I think it's great that debate has moved back towards valuing both uh, to a large degree and no longer just uh, certain people perhaps focusing too much on impacts and forgetting why principles are important. Principles are important. Don't be afraid to talk about them. Have a backup plan. If, for example, you're opposition and your case was geared towards a particular comparative, but government brought in a different case that was weird, but at the same time, reasonable. Uh, you have to then respond to that new case, right? And you have to move and adjust yourself. Have a backup plan if, for example, uh, certain arguments are no longer working. What are other arguments that you can talk about? Have a general backup plan for what happens if you lose a part of the debate. Because again, you can lose a clash in a debate and still win the overall debate. Let's say there are three clashes and you lose one, but you win two. What is your backup plan here? How do you then prove that the two clashes that you did win are the most important clashes? So those are the kinds of things that you need to already think about or at least discuss in prep. You have 30 minutes, you have time for them, okay? Uh, Preemptions, this is important. Preemptions, predict what will happen in the debate and then ready yourself with the defenses for your case but also ready yourself with the offensive strategy for the other side. You have to know what the other side or predict what the other side is likely to talk about and then perhaps know what to attack from there. And preemptions will help guide you towards planning your POIs. A lot of people think, oh, I don't have to plan POIs. They're happening in the debate. Why do I have to worry about them? POIs are strategy. POIs are part of strategy. There are certain things that you can definitely POI them on knowing preemptions and knowing what to attack them with already will help you at least plan certain POIs that you can ask. This does not mean that all three of you have to ask the same, but you can say that this is a POI that I think we can ask. This is really important. Make an effort to do that and you'll see how your prep changes as well with regards to incorporating different strategies. Don't disregard POIs, especially in formats that allow for them. Uh, don't wait for the debate to then think of really good POIs, you will end up having a very badly delivered one or a very um, half thought through POI anyway, right? So try your best to also include this within your prep. So of course, like when you're effective prepping, uh, when you want effective prepping, always look at the motion. It's very simple, but this has to be in your checklist. The keywords can indicate uh, one of two things uh, or both the direction and the general context, uh, the actors that you have to talk about, the context that you have to discuss that is a burden, as well as goals and burdens with regards to uh, the actual method of the motion. Is it a policy? Is it an actor motion? Is it a, a neutral observer motion? Things like this, right? Is it a regrets motion? This will all define your goals and burdens from a debate perspective, but your goals and burdens in terms of your stakeholders as well and the general direction that you want to take the debate to. Don't disregard it. A lot of teams, they look at the motion, they think, I've done something like this before. Let me pigeonhole the motion that I've had before into this particular debate. Or let me use every single concept that I've been using before into this debate. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. So pay close attention to the motion. Understand that you have negative cases as an option if you're opposition, 
All right. So you don't always have to say that the uh, problems in the debate have to all be fixed or better in your world, just that the policy or the model or the proposal of the government will make things worse. That's entirely okay. Um, this, this may not always be the most strategic uh, because it might not always end up being the most comparative in the debate when it comes to dealing with other arguments on the government side. But just know that this is something that you can do. Having this in your checklist will help you at least realize what you can do. Okay, search for clues. For example, when a debate motion says in a place of X, Y, Z, that particular context will already give you a di direction. Uh, so you want to think about groups of people that are affected by a particular phenomena. You are also, uh, you probably also want to go through this thought process just so that it will help you find the solutions to the problem that you have then identified. Very uh, obvious, but at the same time, this is also important for beginners. Uh, this is also important for WGMs that are trying out debate for the first time. These things might be places uh, in the motion that can help you give uh, can help give you clues to what the debate is likely to be. Um, building the framework. Have this in your checklist in terms of what to do. Ask yourself what is status quo. Status quo refers to the way things exist now. This is likely the part where you ask yourself, what does the world look like right now? What are the incentives of people now? Going from that point naturally should tell you to go to the next point, which is how do we change this? How do we better this? And just going through that thought process in prep already helps you perhaps generate some arguments, right? So how do people behave currently? What did the world look like before? Did it change? If so, how? Ask more questions. Um, the tip that I got from a very, very good debater um, who is no longer debating now, but is, it was themselves a major champion, et cetera, et cetera, is the way to also go through argumentation sometimes is also to just ask very basic questions, find answers to them, and stop that argument when you no longer feel that any form of question is relevant anymore. Sometimes it's just as simple as that. Keep asking until you don't need to ask a question anymore, right? So ask these questions uh, that are necessary and you have different processes and groups that you will cover. Going through the step helps you consciously think about why the debate has to evolve around these different things that you want to talk about. Just stop when it's enough. Sometimes uh, it's as simple as that. Set boundaries for your motions, set boundaries for your models. In this house regrets the use of makeup, for example, teams can be clear about how their burden is not to ban makeup, just to regret the existence of it. Perhaps say, number one, that there have been more harms than benefits. Number two, to say that if it did not exist, that certain things would have otherwise been better off. Uh, and that's something that you need to do in regrets motions anyway, right? But bottom line is, is uh, bottom line is if you have a clear burden, state it, stick to it, don't be afraid of it or try to run away from it, even if the burden is slightly more tricky. You can safeguard yourself, however, against what you aren't required to argue or defend. Stakeholder analysis. So obviously this will help you uh, generate arguments. Uh, what that means is that, uh, what stakeholder analysis means is that you talk about anything and anyone that has a stake or an interest in this debate. They can refer to anything and anyone affected by the debate. What you can do in prep or from personal preparation before a tournament is list out stakeholders that you can generally have a thematic discussion around. So for example, if it's about youth, um, young voters, etc. Perhaps there are already interests or incentives that they are likely to have and things that they are likely to respond to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Preparing yourself already before the tournament with stakeholder analysis just helps you with characterization and more analysis during the tournament. But during prep time, if you start stakeholder analysis, while it's super uh, simple and people might think, oh, it's just like super basic, I learned this when I was a novice, does not mean that it's not valuable as a step, it's still very useful. All right, uh, list up the stakeholders that you can think of. Try to look at whether some arguments can be made about them, but then learn to prioritize the stakeholders. So there are a few things you can do to prioritize stakeholders in a debate. Often people go immediately into, this stakeholder is more important because it's the most vulnerable in the debate. Like that's fine, but that doesn't fully explain more uh, or give you proper metrics to weigh the debate, right? So there are a few things you can do. There are four steps that you can essentially go about um, arguing why this stakeholder should be prioritized. Some stakeholders fulfill all of the, all four of these criteria. Some stakeholders fulfill one, two, or three. Um, that's okay as well, but just have a reason to ground why the stakeholder is important. 
one, who is affected the most. This is in terms of the gravity of the harm, the gravity of the benefit, who is likely to be vulnerable, whatever uh, way that you want to characterize this, they are affected the most by a particular policy and they then have to be prioritized. So if they benefit the most from this policy, um, not passing or this policy passing, we should talk about them. Uh, if they are the ones that are likely to deal with the repercussions of the future, maybe we should be discussing about them. Uh, which is the largest group affected, right? So this one is numerical. So this one strictly talks about, should we care about them if they're the majority? They shouldn't be important simply because they're big in number, but them being big in number might impact the rest of your stakeholders. So just think from that perspective as well. When the largest group affected is important, are they important because they might be number one, the most vulnerable, or number two, that they could change the outcome of something else that could then create a bigger harm on other people. They interact with the first um, uh, prioritization or the first level here as well in terms of who they can affect. Three, what is the likelihood of benefit or harm towards these groups? Now, debates will have different benefits and different harms being thrown about all the time. You have to discuss which one is most likely, which one is, even if not likely, if there is a possibility of that happening, whether or not it'd be important enough have an area of the debate that you are talking about um, that deals with this because there will be motions or just generally there will be harms and benefits discussed in a debate. You need to compare those harms and benefits and then learn to tell the judge which one is most important as well. Is there a unique reason why we need to care about the group? And this is even if they aren't the largest group, right? So if they're a minority in number, if they're a minority in capacity, but also a matter of even if they are a malevolent actor, even if they're one particular leader who is like really, really horrible, but they could be impacted. We need to prioritize this because if this one bad leader goes even crazier or even gets, it gets even angrier, they could impact the biggest stakeholder. They could impact the most vulnerable. They could impact the others with the biggest harm, things like that. Sometimes there are unique reasons you need to care about certain actors even when they are not the largest group, or even when they are not the nicest group. So sometimes um, just know that these things are possible for you to touch on. It's not just they are the most vulnerable in the group and that's your line of analysis. Go further, all right? If you're clueless and this happens to anyone, try and think of um, where something similar has happened before. This is called finding a parallel. Think of a similar situation that might have happened in the past. In the past. Say the motion is this house supports the military intervention in Syria. Some prior uh, reading is definitely required here. And we'll go into this part of the checklist very shortly, uh, but basically prior reading is important, okay? But assuming you don't know enough of what is going on specifically in Syria, or today it could be Iran, it could be Yemen, it could be Brazil, it could be anywhere else, it could be Russia and Ukraine. Uh, you can think about why military interventions have been done in the past, why it might be necessary to do it again, or vice versa, why it shouldn't be done, and so on and so forth. Okay, analogies are helpful. Have this in your checklist. Another thing you can do, try to look at a principle or characteristic that is shared with something else and compare it to your case. For example, a motion reads, this house would ban alcohol. Uh, this is an example that is relevant to some circuits a bit more than others, but uh, you can think of lifestyle habits or choices that governments may have banned in the past or limited in the past, like smoking, right? So from there, you can perhaps discuss harm, health, um, ability to affect other individuals in a third party capacity and vice versa. So for example, um, if you smoke and secondhand smoke travels obviously could harm someone else, you can either say that is a reason that alcohol should be banned in certain situations, or you can also say that is a reason why alcohol should not be banned because technically if you drink and you are on your own, uh, you don't have that, that same capacity to harm anyone else because you are just drinking responsibly without directly affecting anyone else. Things like that could at least give you a direction of the debate. What kind of examples? They don't have to be news materials all the time. Everyday interactions and lived experiences are sometimes the most persuasive form of, form of examples you can use. Uh, sometimes through books and movies, you learn about cultures and how they interact. Uh, lived experiences, like I said just now, can be illustrations. Don't depend on personal anecdotes or experiences that only you yourself have had. Look at shared experiences of people within groups. 
uh, women, uh, WGMs, religious people, non-religious people, minorities, and so on. Taking inspiration from arguments. Some, uh, from examples. Sometimes you are able to generate arguments from an example that you know of. For example, you might be familiar, or most people are familiar with MLK Jr. and how his relatively more cooperative and more diplomatic approach, though actually still quite radi radical, is seen to have influenced social changes, right? A bit more uh, than perhaps some other methods that you can argue. So in these kinds of motions where you have to discuss tactics of a movement or tactics of a leader, things like this could change uh, the way that you behave with those arguments when you look at specific examples and how you can derive or extract logic from that. The examples are not the arguments, the logic behind the examples are the arguments. Responses. So make sure that you also have your checklist with regards to what you have to do. Number one, what is it that you have to prove? What do they have to prove? Attack that. What's hurting your case the most? Respond to that. Don't run away from that, especially in a format like UADC, where it's simply very clearly two teams. The attacks are going to be clear. The attacks are going to be utilized three times in a round um, if, if the team does it well. You have to deal with it, right? Don't be afraid of answering it because you don't know how to answer it. Figure out a way. And the way to answer um, obviously depends on the techniques that you have, which of course uh, should be things that you already have in your arsenal as well. At least be, be exposed to them, even if you're not mastered them, right? So you can negate. You can just say it's not true, explain why. You can say this is a problem solution mismatch. You can say this is irrelevant because it doesn't get fixed. You can say it's irrelevant because the debate does not need to answer this right now because perhaps it is not the most important stakeholder that we are looking at, things like that. You can have reframing and then you can have your trade-offs, right? You can uh, talk about why your benefit is bigger, why even if you do have a harm, the benefit is greater than your harm. Even if you lose a benefit, why is it that by losing that benefit, you gain a bigger benefit either in the long run or from a different community, or the prevention of a much bigger harm is something that you can have here. Things like that can really change the comparatives or change the ways that judges see the margins of the debate that could be relevant when they're deciding your win or loss. Even if argument A is one, our arguments B and C are more important, things like that. Always have even ifs, uh, regardless of whatever argument is, regardless of whatever response it is, right? To start with saying, no, that's not true, even if that's true, what then? Why is this not true? Why is this then more important? Always go through that process. You can have your direct attacks, prove that a specific claim is not true, but then flip it and say, even if it is true, it actually is better for your side and worse for them. Motions uh, often allow for that. Some motions don't, but a lot of motions do. You can flip. Just find out what flipping is, right? Um, prove that their argument is less important or unimportant. So this is minimizing the impact of their claim, mitigate if possible, show that the harm is applicable to their case too, weigh against your counterclaims, best case, worst case comparisons, have these things in your arsenal, prove that their argument does not have the links, uh, mitigation of harms or benefits, all of these things, just have it in a checklist, right? Other things that will help, these are ancillary uh, things that will help you, right? Surroundings. Uh, of debate land. Fact sheets, they help. Um, a lot of people don't do it now, um, but a lot of the, because we've, we've gone into online tournaments, so a lot of people don't really print their fact sheets. But when you go for physical tournaments, it helps to be able to refer to a lot of those different uh, statistics or contexts or just framings, because sometimes you find that, that really good way of framing a particular argument uh, through different forms of researches, right? It's not just one article. Different researches can lead you to different ways of framing. And sometimes you write that down on a piece of paper, you print it out in a tournament. You don't need to memorize anything. Just look at that when you need to. It's there on hand. So just another additional uh, thing that could assist you during the tournament. Why not? Don't be too heavily dependent on them. That means even if you don't have them, don't panic. Create a culture of awareness that is more important. So just be aware of things that are going on and build a sense of understanding of the logic that happens with these different forms of statistics because we're not just throwing statistics here, okay? Uh, build a system that works for you. For people like me, um, uh, previously I would have to extract different forms of like uh, statistics and then put them all in one category. For example, uh, 
successful interventions in the past. Then I'll have a cheat sheet of successful interventions in the past. Create a cheat sheet on just these ones and then have them all listed out so that I can talk about them um, when I need to, but also specify what is it about those specific instances uh, that allowed for them to be successes. That's more important, right? Watch videos if you want to. Uh, if you're not a reader, if you prefer watching infographics, go ahead. But this is also important. Fact checking is just as, as, as important in debates sometimes. Call out misreps in debates, especially if you are a WGM. Um, I have been at the end of this where teams have gone to say, oh, the speaker didn't say anything, dot, 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 dot. So in reply, you bring it back and say, actually, I did say a lot of different things. One, two, three, four, five, right? And then say them out loud. Don't be afraid. Don't let them misrepresent you. Don't let them discredit you. But also just have that audacity. Like I said earlier, like do it, right? Um, you have to have the attitude of not um, letting anyone misrepresent you. And in the same way that never say die attitude when you are at tournaments as much as possible. So even if you are losing a round, bounce back the next round. Um, Things that you should also remember when it comes to arguments and generation of cases, intuitiveness, strength of your claims, comparing uh, best materials from both sides, prioritizing the most important and strategic aspects. General themes to note uh, would be important as well. What this means is that you don't necessarily have to follow and track every single tournament and see how they operate, but know that cert certain uh, motions or certain ideas or certain general discussions that can happen in many variations of debates are things that you can already familiarize yourself with. So these things are things that might have constraints or determine uh, incentives. Money, religion, wealth, pleasure, liberty, nationalism, they might have different ways of affecting someone's motivations. Um, looking at capacity or looking at how individuals uh, react and behave, what exactly do they have this information? What exactly do they then do with that information? Uh, do they act on limited information? What are those things, right? Um, even when you're discussing rights, what are the things that are important? Uh, because these are generally things that everyone knows. There's a duty to have something done, but what exactly do we value about it? What exactly is intrinsic to us as people? Why do we think the government should protect it, et cetera, et cetera? Familiarizing yourself with these contexts or these questions that you should already know will help you a lot in many different versions of debates, regardless of whether they are a quote unquote easier social motion or a more complex technical motion later on when it comes to statehood, when it comes to government institutions, when it comes to uh, motivations of countries, etc. These kinds of questions, they just generate the same thought process that will help you already. Right. So part three, this is specifically for anyone who is more a career judge or someone who wants to be a judge uh, a lot more now as well. Um, what you need to know is that if you are a judge, other than the ways to manage the discussions that I mentioned earlier, those things you definitely need to keep. This one will focus on a bit more of what you need to do. Everyone starts from square one or most people, unless they're completely like amazing from the start but don't understand why they're amazing. They still have to understand the techniques of judging. Uh, so you still have to go through different tournaments, even if it means sometimes you have to have the humility of starting as a trainee for the first six months of your career. And then immediately after that, shooting up into positions of chairing, getting IA ships, et cetera, do it, right? If you are committed, go ahead. If you are a WGM and you feel that like this is a daunting prospect, that you are always stuck in trainee positions, uh, you feel demotivated. Sometimes this happens, right? The same way that speakers can also be affected by the same thing, you can um, take a bit of a break. Sometimes it's okay to just take like the space of two months away from debate and come back. Maybe after then uh, having grown a bit more, having understood, sometimes certain things just click in place and you understand that's a comparative. Maybe I got the right judge now to tell me or teach me what exactly is a preemption and I understand it more now. If you are a beginner, uh, if you are a, begin a beginner at judging, go through the process of having to do a bit more of those uh, tedious tasks at the beginning. It will happen for you if you stay committed, right? If you are someone who is interested in edge coring, if you are starting out, uh, you may not immediately have the edge core opportunities that you want, right? So. Even if you break 100, 100 tournaments, right? Maybe you will lose up to someone who has broken 100 tournaments 
that you did, as well as broken at maybe 50 major tournaments that you did not, right? So understand that there's a level of humility here as well that is required for you to just keep going uh, with certain tasks that are a bit more time consuming. So it might take you longer, but it doesn't mean that you won't get there. If you really want it, you can. Take whatever edge core position you want. Uh, you it is given to you, is offered to you at the beginning. My very first edge core position was a random tournament uh, in my like home state. So it, it didn't have to be big. You don't have to have a big start, right? So work your way through. It's about learning the ropes. So learning the ropes is more important because it allows for you to then navigate your way through more and more tournaments a bit more confidently. And that's important. Once you built that, everything else comes naturally. That includes self-belief, it includes your creativity, it includes your willingness to experiment. All of these things, they just take a bit more practice, okay? But be willing to do them. If you are a WGM going for positions of at core ships and you are worried that your CV might not be good enough, ignore that voice, just go for it. The worst thing you can do or the worst thing that can happen is you don't get it, right? That's the same as you not applying at all. So that's there's no point in you worrying about, oh, if I apply and I won't get it, that's going to be embarrassing for me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said earlier, a lot of the people have half of your CVs, but twice the audacity. I've uh, seen some people who have really strong CVs, but they're worried about how they'll get discredited. A lot of this is unfortunately the uh, effect of conditioning. Uh, WGM communities or WGMs often downplay their own successes, censor their own successes, feel the need to be too humble at things. I said humility was important earlier, but that's within the context of working hard, not the context of ignoring your successes. All right. So if you are someone who has done the work, you know who you are as a speaker, as a judge, and as an at core member, then to hell with anyone else or any other voice that is essentially making you feel like you are inadequate, right? So just apply. Worst case scenario, you don't get it. No difference from you not having applied. But if you do get it, that's something that opens you up to a different set of opportunities that you might be interested in. Maybe you get free trips. Maybe you get new friends. Maybe you get new experiences and new circuits. Do it. Go for it, right? So always apply even when you're not sure. Just go for it. Lastly, uh, managing expectations and realities, okay? So what this part is supposed to discuss is uh, just a few things. Number one, very relevant to what I just mentioned, criticism, downplay, uh, and all of these other things, right? So the expectations that a lot of us have in debates um, are tied to a lot of like ambition, and that's great. When you're in any competitive sport, you definitely want to do as much as possible. If that is your aim, that like you want to win tournaments, you want to do this, you want to do that, you want to be known, et cetera, et cetera. But just take some steps back as well at times to remind yourself that those things aren't everything. So just because you may not have won a particular tournament or you may not have succeeded in becoming overall best speaker at a tournament that you really, really wanted, or, what, or like whatever other success that you really, really wanted and that did not happen, that it may not be a direct evaluation on your quality because sometimes different factors affect those things, right? Maybe certain judges <clears throat> were a bit more, uh, like what do you call that, uh, like friendly with their scores. Certain judges were more stingy with their scores, generous uh, with certain credit, uh, like crediting of speakers, et cetera, et cetera. Like those things, can't always be controlled in a, in a, in a straight line in, at tournaments. They will affect different people differently. Sometimes, um, depending on the debates as well, they could get uh, messier and that could affect your interactions. It could affect your scores, et cetera, et cetera. Like a lot of these different things are factors that don't always get taken into account. And while it's a good personal threshold of like, oh, one more thing I can add to my CV, no one really cares about those things when it comes to seeing your quality as a judge, as a speaker, or as uh, an ad core member, right? So when it comes to judges uh, doing really well, what people remember would be this person judged the finals of a particular tournament, not where they ranked in the top 10. Obviously, they do remember top 10, but when it comes down to it, even if you did not rank in top 10, the fact that you were trusted to judge a final was something that's good as well. 
um, the fact that even if you are an overall best speaker, but you are remembered for every single one of your speeches, you should also still take pride in that. Okay. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this is in debate, it, there are some debaters who have never won big majors or never even won world championships, but we acknowledge them as some of the best this sport will ever see, right? And we allow for them that level of credit and that laudability because it is it is like true, even without the credits or without the specific achievements to mark those, uh, those claims. And that is something that we should also afford to other members, uh, including ourselves. So WGMs especially, with the ease that you can afford non-WGMs, that level of credit, you should look at what you have and look at yourself and say, actually, these are really, really, really strong achievements. Um, I don't have to be X, Y, Z champion for me to be known as one of the best in the sport. And that should be something that you sort of condition yourself into believing a bit more uh, to counter all of these, these different uh, negative voices that already exist in debates anyway, and that are intended to bring you down or make you doubt yourself, right? Imposter syndrome happens to everyone, but it's just more true that minority communities and WGMs um, have more of a reason to get sucked into imposter syndrome because there are just more voices to discredit you. When you are judging or you're edge coring, no matter what you do, sometimes people will still say whatever they want. You have to tune that out, right? You have to like ignore the noise, do whatever you have, uh, do whatever you can uh, and enjoy the successes that you have and just embrace your W's, right? So em embrace your wins and just forget everyone else. Like at the end of the day, what some people think will not matter. If they're not the ones that you go for opinions that you value, they shouldn't be the ones that you go for um, negative criticism or co constructive criticism. At the end of the day, you have to treat them as insignificant to your level of success because your success will not go away despite what other people tell you. So WGMs, be, be a bit bolder, uh, be a bit more willing to just go for whatever you want to go for. The worst case scenario is you don't get some of them. Just continue going for them if you want. Uh, the successes will come naturally, but don't let anything deter you from understanding yourself and understanding your worth, especially in debates, right? Uh, mental health is important and all of those things, but also self-belief and not having that be defined by surrounding factors is also important. That is now, I think, end of time, all right? So I'll let you, all, you guys go. I'll let you all go now. Have a good night or have a good evening wherever you are. And thank you.